Hello, everyone, and welcome for joining us for the first, po first podcast of the new month, a new quarter, and what a way to kick things off with our special guest once again returning for a reprise, Mr. S. G. Anon, who needs clearly no introduction. So uh, strap in and enjoy the show, folks. We're going to cover a lot of material today. If you are, in fact, new to the channel, please do like and subscribe and share that notification bell so that others can gain the knowledge that you are currently being afforded. S.G., as always, thank you for joining us. Honor to have you here. Thank you for having me back, John. It's good to be here. Yeah, pleasure. So a lot's happened, as you know, obviously, S.G., from our last uh, discussion back in mid-February. So I'm going to be uh, throwing a lot at you, probably some things that you're probably well aware of and have, have chewed on since our prior conversation. Let's kick things off first, S.G., with uh, some financial stuff. Uh, I asked this question of our guests last week, Greg Manorino, so I'm looking forward to your insight on it. With respect to the Japanese yen, as you're probably aware, it's gone down against the dollar, according to Gold Telegraph. I believe even you made a uh, podcast on your Telegram, or you did an article on your Telegram that we used on our channel as well to cross-reference it. But at any rate, uh, the yen is now currently, according to them, a 34-year low against the dollar, and they're dumping our treasury bonds precipitously over the ship. Um, do you see them running into the bricks? And if they do so, when do you see that happening? And do you think that will be enough to save their economy? Um, and that's a very, very interesting question. I don't think that we're going to see Japan ushered into the BRICS, at least in, in that particular auspice. I think it's possible that we see a reshaping of the Japanese and North American financial markets into something that is very similar to BRICS. Excuse me, Japan and China have had to sort of have an ancestral you know, history of competitive, uh, spirit of competitiveness against one another. So I think it would be difficult to get those cultures into the same trading and economic block, although I'm not a financial expert or an Asian culture expert. So people out there should sort of take that you know, with a grain of salt. That being said, I can absolutely see uh, the position right now happening with the Japanese yen that could very well lead to a transformative discussion process that has to happen. A lot of people are not aware that Japan and the Japanese economy absorb a tremendous amount of U.S. commercial manufacturing debt. Uh, in other words, debt, you know, taken against facilities and warehouses, debt against very, very large, you know, multi-million dollar pieces of machinery, et cetera. A lot of that is held in Japanese financial markets. So seeing this particular process, which is concurrent with the degradation of the U.S. economy, I find it absolutely fascinating that we're down now to a 34-year low against the dollar when the dollar itself is also falling relative to basically every other market around the world. Uh, this shows a spiraling collapse in that Asian uh, market sector. We know that the Chinese economy, for as much as bravado and brashness as the Chinese like to give off, their economy is actually quite fragile and primarily debt leveraged, a lot like the United States. Uh, you could say, I think, even more so pound for pound relative to the actual productivity of the citizenry. But their economy is so heavy on industry and commodity production, right? You know, refineries, um, uh, uh, retail goods, manufacturing, things that are actually being produced of value and then resold, that the Chinese have been able to absorb that, I think, much better than the U.S. financial market and financial economy, which is primarily digital, right? We've got a tremendous amount of manufacturing that underpins that, but most of that manufacturing is decades old. And the amount of our actual building new manufacturing, right, the quantity of that actually occurring, I think, has been very, very low over the last few years when we look at the numbers, with the exception of President Trump's presidency. And it's really down tremendously and in a statistically significant way over many decades, going back to the, you know, the late 1980s, early 1990s. So the behavior of the Japanese yen is important, I think, for patriots out there to recognize because it's a direct indicator of the health of the U.S. economy in a in a real commodity sense and so what you've got here is you have a you know a, a an economy that is publicly known is publicly accepted now to be very fragile uh very debt leveraged against itself adding more debt continuously to that blob monster if we want to call it that most of it is fiat most of it is is financial services to some degree insurance title companies things of that nature but the actual uh industry the actual economic health of the the real commodities generation sector, the manufacturing sector is far and away much, much worse here in the United States of America than what people are even realizing. And the behavior of the yen is a very good way to read that. And when we look at the uh, competitive market dominance that I think is, is, is coming out with this triad of North Korea trying to reassert itself militarily, China attempting to save 
uh, and, and aggregate to the greatest degree possible all of the Asia, uh, you know, the Asiatic sector under its economic influence because of its own debt leveraged economy. And then you have the Japanese that are down uh, tremendously against the dollar, dumping the U.S. treasuries as well as is China and South Korea. I think that we're seeing the pre the precipitating events that are going to lead to a military conflict in the Pacific. Yeah, it's and really. <laughs> It's funny, SG, we're kind of reading each other's lines because that was my next segue question because you know that uh, China has a tremendous amount of leverage on a lot of countries, Japan you know, being no exception to your point. Um, that kind of precipitated a thought I had for you for our discussion today, which is uh, the next one, which is China-Taiwan. Uh, it's been kind of quiet on the surface because of everything else that, that's going on in societally that we'll be talking about and, and, and all the financial um, happenings, for lack of a better word, but uh, I know it's kind of sort of dormantly under the wings there, the China-Taiwan, quote, conflict. Um, if you have one, can you kind of give us an update on where you see things as, as the latest report with China-Taiwan, and when do you foresee that happening based on where we are today? You still there, SG? I apologize. Yes, I had my, I thought okay. I had myself unmuted, but I did not. No um, With regards to the eruption of hostilities in the Pacific theater, we've been talking about this coming now for quite a while. As a matter of fact, President Trump gave sort of the, the all clear, if you will, from the position of the 45th president of the United States for China to move in that particular action in a, in a sleight of hand information warfare message that was carried out. I believe it was at a rally in Pennsylvania in September of 2022, and President Trump came out and said, China with Taiwan will be next, referring to Russia and Ukraine. Um, not might be, not probably will be, said will be next. So we went through all of 2023, and clearly what we saw were preparations for war on a number of different sides. The Chinese have accelerated conscription and training schedules. They've been increasingly more saber rattling and brazen there in the South China Sea region. The Chinese Coast Guard has now interfered with Filipino ships that are in the region. The Chinese Air Force is regularly conducting direct flyovers of the Ty Taiwanese island uh, in violation of Taiwanese airspace. We're seeing U.S. military naval assets, specifically from the 5th and 6th Fleet, that are being, uh, being fed and alerted to these types of things and being repositioned throughout that South Pacific theater, spe uh, specifically uh, in and around the Marshall Islands. So... There's a lot that occurred over the last year, you know, when we look back at, at our time frame here, a lot of these events, we like to think that we can accomplish them in weeks or even a couple of months, but some of them take, you know, literally years to coordinate and move the levers of society in such a way that we can position countries, right? We're, we're moving around nation states in this process. And so the conflict with Taiwan, I think, is actually going to come this year. I think that we stand to see it perhaps even at the end of the spring or early summer, Chinese state media. Uh, has recently put out that the Taiwan's outgoing president, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, actually has plans to flee to the USA in the event of conflict erupting with China. This was a report that was actually conducted by the People's Liberation Army in 2021, but has now been put out by the Chinese state media, I think, in preparation for a discreditation, a discreditation campaign against the government of Taiwan. And that's a necessary portion of psychological warfare uh, when you're talking about nation states coming together in a militarized conflict way, both nation states will seek to destabilize the confidence of the population of the other nation state in their institutions and in their in their institutions ability to preserve and protect whatever territorial integrity, whatever national identity and culture is currently at stake. So we have the the rattling escalating significantly over the last few months. And now we have the Chinese media machine in the actual PRC of China. Uh, beginning the information warfare campaign against the Taiwanese government, I would say that we're probably weeks, not months, away from this conflict beginning. Yeah, that's it's really interesting, actually, because I remember last year, right around the holiday period, you were on an interview with a, a female podcaster whose name escapes me, but I know you get on a lot of different coverage. Obviously, people are wanting to hear your, your musings on all this, but you were saying, uh, to my recollection, that you wouldn't see a case where the first we get out of the first half of this year without seeing uh, elements of the financial reset, Nasara and the like, and then including that, and that makes China Taiwan. And now here we sit in April, in the beginning of it, and it's lining up perfectly 
from what it appears from what you were saying many, many months ago, it does seem like it's it's you know hovering right over the, the trajectory line. So um, pivoting forward, SG, uh, a discussion I'm sure you've been inundated with for the past week to week and a half, the, infinite, the infamous Francis Scott Key Bridge. Um, a friend of mine and actually a brother of mine lives in uh, Columbia, Maryland, that adjoining area. So he knows that bridge quite well. Lots of discussion, lots of uh, speculation on different you know, fronts about what that particular incident meant. I uh, want to know, obviously, what your take on it and what you think the significance of this event is. Um, you know, my take, and just for the audience out there, a more expanded version is available in file 73 because we probably don't have time to deep dive into my take on this. But my Reader's Digest summary would be that unknown parties that are as yet to be identified as far as whose side they may or may not be on caused a significant uh, false flag event in the port of Baltimore there in Maryland, USA, using cyber and kinetic means. And it looks like we saw involvement from 501c3 nonprofits, the United States government, specifically procurement programs for the U.S. Department of Defense and other government programs, as well as the Biden White House uh, and, and um, the FBI. So what is so powerful about this, John, is, is the fact that we really are not sure who may have been responsible for something like this, because at the same time, we are aware that there are unusual and irregular military operations happening around the rest of the planet um, and have been happening for a long time going and shipping is certainly an arena that's been targeted before, right? We've seen this with the Suez Canal, a couple of other canals. Uh, we've seen ports that have been deadlocked and gridlocked and shut down. Um, you know, for security concerns or, or scares and things like that, not a lot of information offered. So there is something going, you know, going around there in the world regarding, you know, that particular angle. And that's worth and that's worth considering. But the reason I think that this may have been a bad actor attack, and, I, and again, I say that not being 100 percent certain, is because the symbolism used is very powerful. The attack itself occurred. The bridge collapse occurred at 128 a.m. Uh, on the morning of 326 on January the 28th or 128 of 2022, the resident Biden visited a collapsed bridge in Fern Hollow, Pennsylvania. So we have symbolism at play there that's very powerful. Excuse me, Dali, the word Dali, I believe means death or end. Um, I, you'd have to double check me on that, but I heard that circulating through the podcast space. The vehicle is clearly interfered with on a power generating level, according to the videos. Uh, also, according to the video, if we slow it down to 0.25 speed or one quarter speed, we can see simultaneous explosive devices of some kind that are detonating along the top of the bridge superstructure in perfect correlation, coordination time-wise to the impact uh, of the super tanker on the pylon of the bridge. So, you know, this particular you know event, it accomplished a number of different things. And if we break it down from both sides of an irregular war, we accomplished a couple of good things and a couple of you know, very bad things. We have crippled the eastern seaboard's uh, ability to move fuel, for example, and vital chemicals that are necessary for uh, U.S. manufacturing in, in and of that region. So you're going to see shortages of things that are um, you know, formed plastics, for example. Uh, you're going to see sh higher prices of fuel as a result of this. It's possible that you see larger um, food prices or higher food prices as a result of curing processes and pesticides that are used in the major food industry. So you're going to see you know, consequences that are not good for the population of the United States, where it makes us vulnerable on an infrastructural level. We cannot deploy naval assets out of the port of Baltimore, which is right there. It's a very large port you know, directly into the Atlantic. So it cripples that in that particular regard. It's not a deep port, so you can't move subs in and out of this area. Um, so the surface, you know, the surface traffic is actually quite important, as is the bridge itself. This is a brilliant you know, attack on infrastructure of the United States. At the same time, the Port of Baltimore is a first port of call for Evergreen Marine Shipping, which we know is a company heavily involved in human and child trafficking, weapons and drug smuggling, etc. And, uh, and in at least one instance, we have uh, good online evidence to show dropped you know, on different forums and open source channels online back in early January, or excuse me, early April, I believe it was 2021, of the Ever Given, which is a, a container ship also belonging to the Evergreen, running aground in the Suez Canal, and everything from very advanced weaponry to human beings were pulled out of some of those containers aboard that ship. 
So these are things, you know, this is a nebulous environment where it's hard to say what happened. But what we can categorically say is the the uh, web that made possible the actual demolition event of the bridge itself seems to have had advanced foreknowledge on the behalf of bad actors. You have the Biden administration adjusting uh, U.S. maritime policy by executive order involving the FBI and the DHS as a result of those adjustments in the Federal Register. You have the Coast Guard and the U.S. Maritime Administration issuing renewed guidance related, pertaining to cyber threats against U.S. ports and waterways. This is all leading up to the event. On January the 25th, the Maryland Transportation Authority held uh, a meeting where they approved a contract with Alliance Incorporated for janitorial services on the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Alliance Incorporated is a 501c3 nonprofit that provides business services through government uh, uh, nonprofit uh, you know, procurement programs. One of those programs is Ability One, which is the federal DOD procurement contracting program that I just referenced a moment ago. So you have the US DOJ, FBI, DHS, uh, potentially the US Coast Guard, the US um, uh, you know, 501c3 nonprofits, potentially some sort of web that exists there. Uh, who knows where the financial entanglements go here? And the gentleman who's currently the head of the Maryland Transportation Authority has a more than decades long history with a group called WSP Global, formerly Parsons Brinkerhoff International Engineers and Architects. And one of the largest shareholders for WSP Global is JP Morgan. Well, that's that says quite a mouthful. It's pretty foretelling. As you said, you go right up to the top of the food chain with uh, J.P. Morgan, you can see who's clearly helping facilitate the funding of all this uh, corrupt activity all the way down, like you said, to the food processing aspect. Um, and this is just my personal. I thought about this event the last week and a half, and, you know, obviously a lot of people are kind of, you know, chewing and marinating, marinating on it, what it means for them and what they think it could mean. That's fine. One of my thoughts, SG, just take it or leave it, was sort of what if, you know, Q always said, watch the water, right? And a lot of people in uh, different circles, some military, some not, have said that uh, they believe that the uh, one of the Black Swan events would be a military or geopolitical event at sea. Now, technically, it's not obviously in a major, you know, Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, or even the Aegean Sea or the Red Sea, but it was technically on the water at sea. Do you think, with that perspective in mind, that uh, this is one of those possible Q events to be watching in terms of, uh, you know, a water or a political attack event, if you will. Um, you know, it's very interesting. I have an opinion on the watch the water drop that I think a lot of people out there maybe don't have or that I've not heard put out in, in a real public way. And the opinion of that is that watch the water is allegorical. Um, it's thematic. And so, and this is just, again, my opinion, my own speculation based on my, my experiences, but when we look at things like the Tucker Carlson interview with Vladimir Putin, which was historic and essentially evaporated 40 years of programming, you know, with the East versus West and the idea that Russia is somehow the bad guy of the world, there was a glass of water on the table there. President Trump often had glasses or bottles of water around him during speeches and press conferences that were given during the first Trump administration. A number of the events that we've seen happening along in this process have, of course, been at sea to include the United States 26th uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit receiving diplomats from Saudi Arabia at sea in, interna in international waters in August of 2023. So there's a lot of watch the water, th you know, thematic, I think, symbolism that's at play here, especially with something like the Port of Baltimore, uh, which is obviously, you know, the, the Water Association is sort of on its face implied in the, in the venue, but such a broad reaching effect uh, is is felt from an event like this. And can you imagine what it would have been like in the summer of 2001 if Americans had been as, as connected digitally through the information age as we are now and began to take notice of things like, you know, convoys of Department of Justice unmarked vans removing things or taking things to World Trade Center number seven? What What sort of curiosities and awakenings could that have potentially spawned off leading up to that event? Uh, and I think I talked about this on file 73, you know, leading up to an event like the demolition of a bridge or the controlled demolition of skyscrapers. This is not accomplished with 72 hours of prep time. These things are weeks in the making, often months in the making. You have to move a lot of capital. You have to move a lot of personnel. You have to get a lot of NDAs signed. You have to allow time to pass 
so that compartmentalization can take place so that those that are participating in the false flag attack to the greatest degree possible, and especially the useful idiots that are so heavily employed by this criminal syndicate at the very top, are not aware of what is actually going on. They're, they're essentially kept in the dark about their own activities, much like the pilots who are flying the missions that are dropping chemtrails. Many of them believe that they're dropping substances in the atmosphere to combat global warming. So understanding then that we're in that same sort of information psyop warfare and talking about you know, a few very important junctions in the overall criminal matrix that allow the entire process to proceed with the sort of uh, tacit complicity or the tacit agreement uh, out of, you know, basically a lack of informed consent through the rest of the organizational matrix structure. That's the same sort of thing I think that's at play here uh, as was at play on the, the 9-11 style events, right? And so as we look as we look at watch the water and what those types of things might mean, I think that we're being highlighted a way of thinking. It's a way of conduct, a way of uh, playbook behavior that this deep state has always used. They've always bent the law. You can do that, of course, of course, if you're on, you know, under the law of the water or the law of the high seas. Uh, they've always adapted the game to serve their purposes. That's available to them under maritime and admiralty law, which were what we just referenced a moment ago. Um, our court systems, a great many of them with few exceptions, uh, are uh, primarily commercial entities and maritime jurisdictional systems that profiteer off of the uh, fallacy of the illusion of due process here in the United States of America. So I think Watch the Water is, is teaching us a new way of life, a new way of critical analysis, and things like the Port of Baltimore, um, the Oklahoma Bridge that was struck just yesterday, I believe, or the day before. There was another bridge struck on the same day as Baltimore. It was struck in Ohio. Um, we have bridge collapses recorded in Pennsylvania, recorded in New Mexico, recorded in Texas over the last four to five years. So this, I think, is very, very symbolic in waking the public up and, and allowing for the United States peoples, the peoples of the United States, to understand that their government is not only not serving them, their government is attacking them. Yeah, absolutely. It's no question about that. The enemy within. Uh, it's funny that you should mention the Sawasaw Bridge, I believe, in Oklahoma over the weekend, which I think borders, if I'm not mistaken, Arkansas are very close to it. Um, so you mentioned several bridges that were sort of uh, sort of in a line of a domino effect, if you will. Do you see this being a continuation throughout the country and the world? And what else do you think this might be leading to? Um, I do see this as a continuation, and I think that this is going to lead to some amount of blending between civilian levers of society and their, abil their ability to enforce, excuse me, civilian loss and, and civil society processes and militarized or agency militarized support for the same end. And so, you know, I understand that that's sort of a nebulous answer, but what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is we're going to cross into territory in this journey at least here in the United States of America, I think we're already beginning to cross into it in certain nations in Western Europe, where you're going to see uh, militarily supported agencies acting on behalf of some sort of national emergency mission, some sort of disaster process that gets, um, I think, launched or, or gets really underway and picking up steam here in the USA. We know that if the if if our lying eyes don't deceive us, and we and we you know, use logic to extrapolate our journey over the last three to four years, what we can say for certain without question is that they will not allow the 2024 presidential election to occur in any semblance of normality, in any semblance of, uh, of standard processes having come before, because the cheat would have to be so astronomically big that there would be, I think, no public resistance, even in some of those more leftist camps at some sort or, or, or to some sort of militarized or domestic preservation exercise interference or intervention to stop that process. So the only way to prevent, uh, I think, the justice that is going to come to these individuals, especially those that have yet to pick a side and have yet to choose which side they're going to come down upon uh, for the history books, is to attempt to stop that election process, to attempt to, pro to provide justification for some sort of crisis, some sort of disaster, some sort of emergency situation, uh, which can then be bolstered, of course, with the importation of, of thousands of migrants. And we've seen uh, a, um, a number of millions actually imported into, into the United States just over the last three and a half to four years. I think it's four years almost 
uh, right around at this point here and now. Excuse me. So, you know, in this process, or three and a half years, excuse me. So in this process, um, I think you're going to see a, a breaking down of what Chris Miller called civil society's ability to operate, civil society's ability to function. Uh, I think that a financial crisis of some kind will likely be involved heavily in that, uh, particularly towards the end of that cycle, the end of that disaster crisis, because that wakes everybody up, right? Once once you get between someone and their wallet, it does. It's almost it's almost as violative in some regards, I think, mentally as as actually barging into someone's home and attempting to take their home. And we've seen that uh, uh, amplified in this process as well through the illegal immigration discussion. So. And then where that where we go from there, John, is very difficult to forecast because this is entirely original territory. This is entirely unprecedented here in the United States of America. If we choose to believe certain entities online, such as the Q operation and the Q entities, there is a strong and powerful message that states there will be no civil war. Uh, there will be no major mass civil unrest. But it does not say that we won't have pockets of civil unrest. It does not say that we won't have uh, isolated incidents where things may get a little gritty before they get better here in the United States of America. We are importing the criminal underworlds of most of the rest of the developed planet. But the implied, or excuse me, the, the implicit benefit in that, the silver lining, if there ever was one here in the United States of America, is that by doing so, we are importing out of those other countries the very entities and institutions that would be able to usurp those other countries' governments. So we're putting ourselves in a position where we can cooperate as we the people with true representation across boundary lines, true representation and true diplomacy happening at the international level that's not marred or manipulated or forcibly militarized in some form or fashion. Now, that's a lot of pie in the sky, and I understand that, but we have to look at this in a longitudinal position. If we're going to try and pivot the planet to a way of life that we want to have, to a way of life that is free of the pharma cartel, free of the international banking cartel, free of the military intelligence cartel, and the manipulations and arms of that criminal syndicate that make dark uh, black market tra trafficking, black market smuggling possible, then I think this is one of the cogs in that wheel that has to turn. And we will eventually grind, John, I think this wheel to a halt prior to the November elections here in the United States. Yeah, I agree completely. Um gentleman bill holter who we've had on our program several times i'll have again this month was on x22 yesterday and, and it's his it's strong contention that there's a greater than 50 percent chance that we're not going to have elections by november and the more that we see things happening I, I think that's right because there's just too much momentum building for president trump optically beyond those of us who are already you know enlightened and awake at this point on channels like this that know that they they can't cheat their way enough i mean we're going to get into a subject in a second that touches on what you're talking about. Um, let's so with that in mind, let's pivot um, forward and backward at the same time back to the original discussion of finance. Um, SG in uh, Iraq in two weeks. Uh, right now, they're still finishing up Ramadan. I think Eid al Fatar goes from the 9th to the 14th this year, and then Sudani, their prime minister, is slated to come uh, to the U.S. on the 15th uh, to meet with certain officials. <laughs> loosely phrased, and, uh, and with the intent to ask the military militias to stand down uh, in, in Iraq to their intention to come back to the international stage, and then also uh, requesting uh, Jeanine Planchet, the head of the UN foreign relations between uh, uh, the UN and Iraq to turn on the uh, purchasing power for them to come back internationally, which we've all been anticipating, obviously, for, you know, for quite some time. Um, so I guess my question to you is kind of a twofold. They have to come back to Iraq after this, right? We know that the U.S. deep state is not going to go quietly into gently into that good night. They're probably going to incite some type of uh, sanctions or stand down against Iraq once Sudani gets back. He's got to deal with Maliki in Iraq, who is an Obama holdover or Sotera holdover, and you know he's been living off the drug of the U.S. dollar, which they're continuing to slowly wane away from that country, which we've also been anticipating in terms of, you know, the currency auctions and the money laundering and all of those nefarious activities. Um, how do you see this playing out? And who do you think Sudani is actually meeting with when he comes to DC? I think my, 
the my answer to the last part of that question is I haven't the faintest clue. I think that you have secret uh, operatives, quite frankly, working on behalf of dual governments here in the United States of America. I think some of those operatives are actually out of the State Department on behalf of the uh, the black hat actor side, the dark actor side. And other operatives from the Secret Service or the United States Treasury, I think, would be my candidates for you know meetings on behalf of, of good actors. So I couldn't say who he's meeting with. I will say that the significance of Iraq should not be overstated, um, the or excuse me, understated. The, the Iraqi countryside is home to some of the oldest antiquity of all of civilization. And it's actually one of the reasons that the military industrial complex under the 43rd president utilized 9-11 as a vector to go into Iraq that was always part of that plan, as well as a number of other angles, which they were very, very successful with regarding the subjugation of Afghanistan caves, um, the opium trade, and of course the fuel and energy reserves in that area of the world. But beyond those, you had the, um, <clears throat> the claim to the possession, uh, the claim to possession of very, very ancient and very, very advanced technology uh, in the areas of Iraq, in the caves of Afghanistan, that were the main and primary aim of the military industrial complex at large. The intelligence community headed by the Mossad, the U.S. Pentagon, and the various warlords involved out of the Pentagon, and those deep agency connections between private lobbying defense contractors, the Pentagon, and the CIA. So the and I, I i paint this picture so that people have an understanding of what's really going on here in the middle east because you're talking about not only a recalibration of world finance you're talking about a recognition that some uh, cultures and some nation states here in the in, in on this earth here in this world that we all live in have different claims to different things of antiquity because of their association because of their bloodline because of uh, things that are true of their ancestry and heritage and of the, the topography and territory that they live in. And there is a, rec a recognition and a reconciliation that's happening in that area of the world regarding some of this. Uh, I'm talking about you know, technology that has religious implications, for example, to the Muslim and Islamic faith. Uh, the same is true for the Hindu faith, right? And some of their technology that goes back thousands of years to the days of the Mahabharata. So the the Iraqi currency coming back to the fore in a properly valued way, a way that no longer makes it the puppet toy of the U.S. Federal Reserve System, that is significant and powerful because it represents the disconnection of one of the largest blood arteries for that Federal Reserve System in the in the sense of energy control. It represents the disconnection physically of actual energy reserves. It represents the disconnection of a major revenue arm, but it also represents the dissolution of certain rights over energy and technology that are present there within those regions, right? The, the Middle Eastern regions uh, uh, and, and in the countrysides of those nations, oftentimes near or, or coinciding geographically with U.S. military presences. And there's all sorts of treatises that get signed with local authorities and you know, different Vichy installations and things of this nature during wartime. And that's one of the reasons a shock and awe campaign was utilized against a Baghdad in 2003. By taking out the central government, you can essentially negotiate local law with the various individuals and communities, towns, and municipalities throughout the countryside. And those that you those that would not cooperate, you would simply overpower and replace with those that would. And that's exactly, of course, what we saw happen from 2003 up to about 2014, 2013, 14, uh, when we started switching gears militarily to other countries, specifically in North Africa uh, and in the Middle East, a little further to the east. So Iraq coming back to the fore, um, you know, the, as of this year, they've banned internal currency transactions um, for um, for U.S. dollars. If, if you're going to come to Iraq, you can only receive Iraqi dinar as part of the currency exchange, and that was a um, that was a very very significant disconnection. I think that happened and was recognized first part of this year. We're now in what was ancestrally as of April first. We're in ancestrally what was the new year here in the world prior to the 18th century and one of the Vatican councils that changed our calendar. Um, and this, of course, is the, the, the year where most of world finance resets, or excuse me, the month where most of world finance resets every April. We have U.S. tax time that comes up this month here in the Federal Reserve System back at home. So I'm looking at this, John, and I'm seeing a very in interesting convergence of forces because it's only been about five weeks ago that President Trump said he was looking for the U.S. economy to collapse or to crash 
and that he hoped that it did so prior to no, to the November election so he doesn't have to be quote another Herbert Hoover. I find the timing here very very interesting with Iraqi with the uh, Iraqis behavior and the the amount of media attention that is being uh, leveraged and utilized to associate Iraq and Iran in the same thought bubble, in the same narrative bubble, to try and say that it's Iranian control of Iraq that's causing issues with U.S. military uh, installations and, and presences there in the Middle East. We're already seeing the setup for this, this black hat res, you know, resident Biden administration, this installation that we're all living with, to go against whatever process Iraq is going to push for at the international stage. Yeah, very well said. I couldn't agree more. And on the backs of that SG, another quick follow-up question for this part of it, this section of it, uh, would be, so you know that Israel is playing a role in this, like we talked about in our last uh, discussion in mid-February, and we've been told on our end to really watch Israel very closely because they were the ones that got ultimately Iraq to spill. They spilled the beans about Iraq and their intentionality to come back on the international stage. So one of my contentions, SG, is once uh, uh, Sudani comes back, um, you know, second half of April, however long, you know, I imagine he'd be out there a few days and comes back later in the week, uh, and all the beginnings of the chaos and manufactured panic happen with respect to Maliki and what we talked about, uh, watching how Israel observes that uh, activity within the whole of that part of the Mesopotamia, as you were saying, the Middle East, um, we're watching for Israel to do their secret nuclear uh, power plant attack against Iran. Remember, President Trump, to your point, had also said that um, Israel is going to make a grave mistake, which we know is not a mistake at all. It's a very scripted event within the playbook and the framework of this operation. So what would you surmise with Israel, the time frame, understanding, you know, I'm giving you some rope here. We know nobody knows the exact date. But um, what would you say the time frame of Israel will be to make that grave mistake following Iraq coming back from the U.S.? I would be very surprised if that mistake is not made prior uh, to Passover, quite frankly. Um, I, I, I look at this, this situation, or, or right around Passover, maybe right after Passover, I look at this situation that's happening in the Middle East with a particularly um, spiritually inspired lens because so much of the current governing structures in the Middle East in the Middle East trace their behavior to festivals and feast seasons uh, in their respective schools of faith back thousands and thousands of years. So these are cultures that, you know, it, if we were to translate them to the Western world, they would be more of like democratic theocracies, right? You have a, a sort of a state faith um, a cultural identity that's based around a faith or a bloodline or a group of people or peoples. And so that plays a lot into the behavior of, of those individuals and those nations and has, and we look at archaeology and history, it has always played a lot into those, those same behaviors at that nation state level. And I wouldn't expect this to be any different. I do think that what you're going to see with the, the uh, ongoing conflict in the Middle East, if I can be so bold, is the occupation of Israel by an Arab coalition. I think that you're going to see the the deposition of the Likud government in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem by force. And I think that you're going to see a significant conflict erupt as a result uh, of that move to occupy the Israeli countryside. And I think that the move to occupy the countryside by a coalition or via a coalition, maybe is a better way to say it, is going to be spawned by two major instances or two major issues. I think that you're going to see... Um, uh, further escalated activity on the Gaza front in the south in the south of Israel and on the Lebanon front in the north of Israel, uh, moving up into Syria, which of course is ancestrally a Syria. If we go and look at the the actual archaeology of that region going back a couple thousand years, and then you're also going to see, I think, a conflict erupt between the Israelis and uh, the the ancestral Persians, the Iranians nowadays. Um, and to your point, I think that is, it is going to be some sort of Israeli strike against Iran, perhaps a strike that results in a Fukushima-style meltdown that is going to provide the justification worldwide for a mass operation where the public is, is willing to accept uh, militarized force in response. And I think you're going to need that, quite frankly, uh, in the Israeli countryside specifically because you have such a deep 
an old entrenchment of extremely dark and occultic practices, uh, but also the the intelligence community and the individual entities or in, or you know entity or entities uh, that control that community, right? So that would be your central banking cartel and the masters that they answer to. Many of those masters, I believe, um, are actually not necessarily fully human. Let's just put it that way. And, and we'll save that for perhaps another show where we have a little bit more time. So in this process, you're going to see Israel um, essentially confirm a, a, a an affirmed position, I think, towards genocide, which is going to shock the consciousness of the world. I think it's going to be played out that way. Um, I think you're going to see Egypt involved in Gaza as a result of that. That brings them into the conflict. I think you'll see Saudi Arabia involved uh, as a result of that as well. So that's going to bring them into the conflict. I think that you will see an attack by Israel uh, on Iran and Iranian forces in Syria, Iran, and Iraq, which I think is going to draw at least Iran, potentially all of those other players into the conflict. And when that occurs, I think you're also going to see Turkey decide that this is their opportunity to move. And it will be the Ottoman Turks here who are the biggest, I think, concern existentially to Israel. So it's it's very possible that you see a Sunni Muslim uh, Ottoman Persian coalition, if we want to call it that, the the Iranian uh, regular military and the Turkish regular military moving on behalf of Syria and Iraq or on behalf of Syria and Lebanon and Gaza, for example, uh, against Israel, you know, all of the way down to the Israeli countryside. And I know that that sounds, you know, very frightening, but remember that we have at least one world leader now in the form of President Putin having declared that his his nation doesn't have enemy nations, it has enemy elites. And I think the same is true, but with a faith-based or religious lens, right, theocratic elites, I think the same is true in the Middle East, right? Why was, for example, the former crown prince of Saudi Arabia dismissed essentially the very next day after President Trump arrived in Riyadh on his world tour in 2017, right? Um, you know, and, and why did we see a tremendous amount of, of high-level Saudi bureaucrats and Saudi officials taken down almost simultaneously in a major law enforcement action? immediately after President Trump left the country. Um, you know, these are questions I think that are worth exploring and asking, and we should acknowledge that they play mm -hmm. into the events that we have now. Why did we have the Abraham Accords? It gives us a basic understanding and underpinning of how a peace agreement can work here in the world, but we have to arrive at a point where that agreement can work long-term. And the only way to do that is to neutralize the Mossad intelligence community and the CIA, CIA and CCP intelligence communities and espionage warfare networks that are built into the Eastern Mediterranean and into the Middle Eastern, you know, ancestrally the Arabic and Mesopotamian countrysides. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then you brought up a great sub point, which we won't have to go wax too poetic on it but it is interesting in the midst of all these things happening with iraq we're watching erdogan make his uh, pilgrimage to iraq here i think in the next week or so roughly two weeks maybe uh we don't know the date yet but uh you know he just suffered a massive um, historic political campaign loss i think he's going to be running through the end of 28 so he's already said he's not coming running back uh, coming back to uh try to run again in the future so you you kind of see a lot of you know, the old guard shifting away, but he's still an integral part with Iraq because of, you know, the Kurdistan region over there and how much they suffered in this three-year budget with respect to the oil credits they were supposed to get. Now they're in sort of a position, instead of having leverage, having to grovel. And, um, you know, Erdogan certainly holds the key to helping that, that critical HCL gas law that we're all waiting on get passed. And then, you know, you didn't mention it, but it's already implied you know, you have the solar eclipse coming next week, and I think there's another one, if I'm not mistaken, for another, I think, 23 to 25 years. And then uh, you have uh, Passover coming in the 22nd to your point where you believe, from what you said, that you think uh, you wouldn't be surprised if, if it happened uh, prior to that point, which is less than three weeks from now. So there, there's so many things circulating this month in such a compressed period of time, it would seem. So uh, the last question for today, SG, because we'll cover this, pick this up next time, obviously, as a segue. But we were talking about, um, you know, in the beginning of our conversation uh, regards to the Japanese yen and what's going on with that country and the inevitability of that once supreme economy coming down. You have another country that's been, not unlike many, suppressed, but one that really has got my eye, which is uh, the nation of Zimbabwe, 
Uh, they have just launched, as you're probably aware, I think three or four Starlink satellites in the last week or so, uh, preparing for July, uh, because I think July, August, they have a, a major election coming up uh, where the people's choice over there is Nelson Chamisa, much like Trump for here. Uh, and they that country stands a lot to gain with the massive amount, as you know, of, of I think a, re a geologist went in recently and found uh, the largest uh, gold holdings in the world there. Uh, I talked to a couple weeks ago, Dr. Scott Young, you may be familiar with, who noted that uh, they found recently 13 trillion tons of diamonds. So we know the vast amounts of assets uh, of underground and, and precious metals and many other things that they have uh, of rare uh, rare gems and metals and, and such in that, in that part of the world, which makes them one of the kingpins and heavyweights of the financial community. And they're ready to come out of suppression. Um, would you say that the Starlink satellites that are going up there, much like here in America, are to catch the election fraud and make sure that this is one of the components to help a country like that uh, prevent corruption and have a free and fair election going forward? I would be extremely surprised if Starlink wasn't involved in that process the world over before we're completely finished here, because the old internet is a design, you know, thoroughly and on its face. Uh, is a design and a reflection of the DARPA community, the Black Intelligence community, uh, the CIA Industrial and Intelligence Complex, and all of the different, you know, tech companies and and various feeder arms and access points that we were given as far as big tech is concerned are all nodes and junctions of that same beast, right? So in order to take out the beast, we have to turn the beast into something else. Um, and I think that's exactly what Starlink is being used for. And as, as that pertains to election security, I think it's not just about election security, but it's also about uh, real-time communication capability when we eventually see this transition through a, a telecom, you know, sort of a 1.0 telecom information age to a quantum-based or a 2.0 telecom information age, which is where we're headed going forward. We need, you know, ether-based internet that has the capability of leveraging the quantum field, the quantum interface at a much stronger and resonant frequency level here at the surface and in our atmosphere, rather than having our, you know, frequency uh, connectivity isolated primarily to submarine, you know, underground fiber optic cables, which of course we know transit about 80 to 85% of all of the world's global telecom and global internet traffic, right, going through these undersea cables. So it's not actually, even though we're, trans, we're transiting data through the airwaves, we're doing so at a fraction of what the actual data exchange here in the world really truly is. And if we have to move into a world where we're going to be instantaneously connected, ostensibly for, you know, minute by minute or second by second, you know, financial reconciliations across nation state borders or the, the, accomplishment, the accomplishment of business negotiations, for example, across nation state borders, according to reflective time zones, right? If we're going to do so in a way that is uh, congruous for the entirety of mankind, we need something that is sort of universally applicable and can be deployed at scale in the upper atmosphere to accomplish that. And so I think Starlink is part of a larger mission in that regard. And I think Zimbabwe is just another country that's heavily involved in that, but ha happens to have a key component offering to the table, right? We have tremendous amounts of rubber. We have tremendous amounts of gold. We have tremendous amounts of, of natural earth ores that are found in Zimbabwe. Uh, a number of exotic fruits, right, are found in Zimbabwe. You could reverse those or excuse me, reverse engineer and understand those for health and wellness benefits, of course, without altering them, right? Breaking them down, dissecting them to understand how they could apply. Um, Zimbabwe is not unlike a lot of those uh, central, you know, Central African nations and Sub-Saharan African nations that are resource rich uh, and, and quite frankly, wildlife rich. They've been pilfered uh, by this, this Luciferian cabal at the hands of the British crown for the last 500 years. Um, you could certainly say that it goes back further than that, but I'm just not experienced in the history, you know, in, in the pre-colonial history prior to that. But certainly for our current discussion, you have a number of nations that have been you know, bludgeoned into submission, quite frankly, over a multi-century period of time. And the U.S. aid arm out of Washington, D.C. and the U.S. military out of the Pentagon are just the, the most recent worldly installments in that overall complex to do just the same. So to see these nations break away 
And to see these nations then have the opportunity to bring their resources at proper valuations, as well as their technical know-how on how to harvest those resources, for example, to the international stage and get proper um, uh, compensation and a proper value exchange for what they're offering, that is historic because it represents the death of uh, the, the swift financial manipulation system and, and the manipulation of worldwide commerce and currency exchange, which is the main component uh, that's happening here that's, that's driving this petrodollar-based cabal to extinction. And the election process and the monitoring of elect electronic communications and the bulwarking and the beefing up and the securing of those digital infrastructures in that nation, just as in other nations, is necessary towards that same end. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, as always, SG, honor to have you here and we look forward to having you again shortly. Um, where can people find out about you, more about your work, and final thoughts you might have for our audience today? My friend, I can be found online at three homes now. I'm on rumble.com slash user slash Q News Patriot. I'm not on Rumble by SG and on. There are copycats out there, but you can find a verified Rumble badge on the Q News Patriot channel. I'm on Truth Social at the handle Real SG Anon with a red check mark, and I can be found on Twitter at the T H E Q News Patriot with a blue check mark. Great. And um, and for those who are interested, who've asked us before about how to connect with other patriots like minded on our channel, and are looking to have more of a uh, intimate personal dialogue, discourse with each other, share information, what's whatnot. Uh, you can find us at clubpatriot.com. That is completely free. The chat room, it much works and operates much like Discord. And, and then there is a separate brain on that side of the website, very separate from the Club Patriot part, which is the Real World Academy. And that's only for folks who are looking to build multiple streams of income and or connect with other business owners, do business, form partnerships, or uh, share uh and private patent ideas and things that they want to uh, merge business ideas with. So uh, we'll leave that link in the description. Thanks, SG, for joining us. We appreciate it. And we look forward to having you again in the, in the near future. Thank you, my friend. Stay safe. It's always good to be here. God bless. God bless you as well.